if you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And we'll be focusing for this message on Romans 8, verse 2. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. And the word of the Lord says, Therefore, there is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, help us to heed the words of Paul and to take notice of what he is not teaching and what he is teaching. Let us be um, let us make sure that we bear fruit and that we make evident the spirit of the law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that we are alive and we are dead to sin. Help us to learn these truths, Lord, and to help me to faithfully um, expound the, these truths in a way that will reach your people. Pray that you will help us honor your word faithfully and be with us this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have, uh, we have a building theme in Roman in Romans six. Paul had to refute against the idea that if we were dead, how can we still live in sin? And he had to refute that because we are dead to sin, we can't live in it. And people uh, have abused that and said if we are no longer in sin, then it it doesn't matter. So Paul, in Romans 6, refutes an error that he had to battle against and that we in our day and age have to battle against as well. He asked, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? And we see that this is a, a building theme because in the first verse of chapter 8, he says, therefore there is now no condemnation in Christ, who are in Christ Jesus. And what is it that Paul has to guard against? He can't be meaning that it's easy believism that, that, that we, once we are in Christ, we can live however we want. It's inconsistent, and, and as you see here in Romans 8, 2. He builds on, on the same refutation that he made in, in 6, Romans chapter 6, verse, uh, one, verses 1 and 2. By stating that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So now we are free from the law of sin and death. And what does that mean? That means that we are saved from the guilt and the power and one day the very presence of sin. Paul indeed distances himself from those that would preach that since we are under grace that we need not worry about our sin. We, we need to worry. We, we need to be constant in, in, and to be aware of what our sin portrays to others and what it portrays to our relationship to Christ. If we are still constantly sinning and battling sin, what does that say about our relationship with Christ? If we be in Christ, we are free from the dominion of sin. Do you see how Paul is building on his doctrine of justification and clarifying any false deductions based on the, his doctrine? He is clearly letting the believers in Rome and other Christians that while it is faith in Christ that justifies, that faith also sanctifies. We must, be, we must understand this. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but in James uh, chapter 2, verse 26, James uh, writes about this. And he says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Yes, we can understand that it is faith that justifies, but if our faith is not working towards sanctification, is it really a, a live faith? This text in James may, may make it seem that Paul and James are at odds, but we cannot, we cannot uh, allow for that because the, there, there are no contradictions in the Bible. Paul in his writings does not teach that this faith does not work. And James is distinguishing from those that pro profess faith, but do not have evidence of that faith. So we will, we will look at this text under, them under three headings. 
First, if we are under the law of the spirit of life, then what is our relation to sin and death? Second, how does the law of the spirit of life impact our life? And third, what are the full implications of being in the law of the spirit of life? First, if we are under the law of the spirit, then what is our relation to sin and death? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the guilt, power, and one day the very presence of sin. We are no longer controlled by sin. It indeed does not have the same impact it once did. We, can be, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Let this be true of us. In the verse prior to the one used for this message, it states that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it seems that one could take comfort, or a false comfort, in the fact that there is now no condemnation. But what does it say after that? It says that we are in the we are in the law of the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. He clarifies what that what there is no no condemnation means. We are now free from sin and death. Therefore, Paul must clarify what being in Christ entails. If we are in Christ, we are no longer in, the bo in bondage to sin and under the condemning power of the law of God. However, this does not leave our sin inexcusable. We are under the law of the spirit of life, which sets us free from the law of sin, as says our text. When we are made alive by God's work of grace on us, then it is inconceivable to go on in our former sins, our former ways of abhorrent sins. Paul makes this clear, like, like we said, in his refutation in chapter 6. There are so many fallacious ideologies of people derived from their ill-conceived notions of Paul's doctrine of justification. And Paul tries to avoid those bad deductions. He's trying to guard against the idea that, yes, we are saved, but that if we are saved, we can live any way we want to. He's trying to guard against that. In chapter 6, we've stated this before, he asks, how can we who died to sin still live in it? If we're dead to sin, is it, is it, is, are, we are we allowed to say we're dead to sin, but still constantly live in those prior sins that have, we've been in bondage to? No. Do you see what Paul must guard against? We are dead to sin. We are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We have life, new life. Therefore, sin and death should no longer reign over us. We must be about the business of putting off the old self and putting on the new self. Go no longer in your old ways of sin, leading to death, and live in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. In Romans 8, Chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, Paul expounds the doctrine formulated from his statement in, statements in verses 1 and 2. So if you would, look at Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4. And it reads, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We now walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. We, we must put off the, our old flesh, fleshly lust and live towards righteousness. Surmise this to say that we could not keep the law if we are left in the spirit of the flesh, in the spirit of the law of life in Christ, we will be considered righteous for our efforts at keeping the law. But we will not be considered righteous because of what we do, but because of what Christ does in us. The law in the flesh was weak. However, God fulfilled the law through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were originally oriented towards our fleshly desires, but with new life in Christ, our wills changed to be obedient children to live towards the Lord's will. If we have spiritual life, we are not, then we are not dead any longer in our trespasses and sins. We have been set free. 
Let us live not relishing in our sins, but fully repenting of them and putting to death the lust of the flesh. We are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Because we have Christ, we are under the new law and we have life. We are called children of God, not children of the devil. Take comfort in this, because we were once, we were once uh, in our sins and children of wrath, but now we are children of God. Forsake sin and let it be no longer a master over you. If you be in Christ, sin has lost its power over you and press on in the mortification of your sins. Once we were slaves to sin, but now we are free from it. Let your life be a great witness to that truth. Do not put all your hope in the fact that in verse 1, Paul says that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not treat this as if nothing after your conversion matters. Understand what this means. This is a precious truth. And to make it that precious truth, we must honor God by trying to obey the law and trying to forsake our sin and trying to go on about our obedient lives to, to the will of the Father. He, Paul claims that we, will have been, we, we have been set free from the law of sin and death. This means that we must humbly bend our wills to obedience to the perfect law of God. Our second point, how does the law of the spirit of life impact our life? For one thing, now we are alive in Christ. Notice it is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We once could not claim this privilege. We were once not united to Christ. This means there should be a drastic transformation of our life from our former ways in bondage to sin. We, met, we have been set free. Take that to heart. Jesus teaches us that he is the vine and we are the branches in, his, in the Gospel of John. If you would, look at John chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. And Jesus Christ says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him... He bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. What is evident about Christ being the vine and us being the branches? We must show life and, and a, our abiding in Christ by the fruit we bear. If we abide in him, we'll bear fruit. And this is, let us this, this be true of us. A sober warning in Christ's explanation is the destination of the branches that are burned and not bearing fruit and cast away. If we are truly united to Christ, we will show evidence of spiritual life. Many look to worldly riches and other things to fulfill them and will never be fulfilled because they, they do not have what they need. They possess no spiritual life and thus left entirely empty spiritually. It is our duty to present these lost souls, the gospel, as opportunity presents itself. We possess something they desperately need. If we truly love them, we should extend the offer of the saving grace united to Christ to them. We must, if we love them, we must share our hope that we have with them that have no hope. Take, take this portion of John. As, an, as, a, as a command to abide in Christ and bear fruit worthy of the gospel. Christ is the vine and we are the branches. Furthermore, our Heavenly Father is the vine dresser. In verse 1 of that chapter, Christ says, I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. So the Father is intricately weaving the, the, the different branches together to make a vine, uh, to make a, the, 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 the fruit much fruit and to, and to intricately wave it so that there's, it's a good branch and, and it's a good vine. Let us bear fruit and let the Father prune us correctly in order that we exhibit more fruit. So that we don't just bear fruit and then 
stay stagnant. We, we are pruned like, like a gardener pruning the, pruning the branches so that it will bear more fruit. So don't stay stagnant. Try and help work with the Father, and the Father will work with the Father will do a great work of grace on our lives so that we bear more fruit. The way one can tell that you have spiritual life is the fruit you bear. Jesus mentions this in part of the ser- his Sermon on the Mount. If you would uh, turn to Matthew chapter six, uh, 7, verses 16 through 20. Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 to 20. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. This is how people know we are Christians, by the fruit we bear. Many may profess Christ, and, and that's, all good and, that's all good, but what is the fruit they bear? What is the fruit that we bear? The spiritually alive person will bear good fruit, while the spiritually dead person will only bear bad fruit. Christ explains that the trees, do not, that, that, the trees that do not bear good fruit are cut down and thrown into the fire. This is the same sad destiny as the branches, the ones not abiding in Christ, that are left to. They are cast and thrown into the fire. So let's be, where, let's be, let's be cautious that we are the good vines and the good trees. Furthermore, we have the imagery in Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, uh, the psalmist describes the godly person as a tree firmly planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither, and in whatsoever he does he prospers. So again we have, again we have the, the imagery of, of a good tree bearing fruit. Obviously the psalmist is likening the godly people to a good tree with much life. Thus we as Christians if we truly be in Christ or in the spirit of the law of life in Christ Jesus. One of the great mysteries unknown to us is how God in his infinite mercy would condescend and have grace upon us to his chosen people by sending his only son to redeem them by his obedience on the cross, his death, his life, his resurrection, his ascension. God indeed did this so that we would have life and life eternal. Not not but to all who are his people. It's not to everybody. In Isaiah, it states that the Lord was pleased to crush him, the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 10 through 2, the prophet Isaiah writes, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will lot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. So we have Christ who, who gave himself willingly on the cross. And not only that, but he lived a perfect life, perfect obedience to the will of the Father. He died, he, ro- he, was ro- he rose again, he ascended. And now our hope, our hope that we have is that he's now interceding for us, his people. The Father willingly gave up his Son to bear the curse that we deserved in order that we might have life in him. This marvelous love is the reason Paul can claim that there is now no condemnation for those that, who are in Christ Jesus. It is also why he can tell us that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. We are free from the bondage of our old life, all because of our great Savior Jesus Christ. Marvel at the great truth that Christ is now at the right hand of the Father, continually eating, interceding for his people. 
His reign as our prophet, priest, and king is eternal. Christ took our place so that we would have life. He secured life for his own people. Our third point, what are the full implications of being in the law of the spirit of life? First, we have a new life. We are transformed. We are under a new law that includes life. If we have life, we should show evidence of life. We are also considered a new creature in Christ. If you would look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And we see, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So the old has passed away if we are in Christ. We are a new creature. Let us, let us grow in Christ and be a new person. Our former life of sin and death has been done away with. We no longer bear the curse we were once under. Paul makes this clear in the text we are using as the main text. He says that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. It is important to note that he is speaking to Christians and being set free from the law of sin and death is only pertaining to true believers. It would really do us good to fully understand this freedom if we would keep constant in meditating on the precious sacrifice of our Lord and Savior on the cross. When we get the right perspective of this dear truth of the precious cost that caused Christ to die on the cross, it will make the freedom more significant. If we understand the the price that Christ paid, our freedom will seem more extravagant. Because Christ demonstrated his great love for us on the cross, we in turn should demonstrate our love by conforming ourselves more and more to his image. This can only be done by the work of God through our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are a new creature. The old self has passed away. All this is due to the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. United to him, we can bear good fruit and demonstrate to lost sinners who we come in contact with that we are true believers and that we are, are, are evidence of God's saving work in our life. Be the light of the world. Cling to Christ and seek first the kingdom of God. Jesus is the source of life. In John 14, 6, you don't have to turn there, but it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the life. No one can have life unless he comes to the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who would neglect so great a salvation? It is a treacherous gamble to toy with the eternal state. There are only two eternal destinations, one of eternal glory or one of eternal punishment. Take heed lest you are found liable of, of eternal damnation. Jesus died for his people. He gave his all for them. He left no stone unturned. Christ laid down his life so willingly so that we could be redeemed from the curse that awaited us. We are no longer in bondage to our sin and death. That is what our text means. We are now servants of righteousness. This is what Christ bought for us on the cross. He bought, he bought us righteousness, his righteousness, imputed to us. He redeemed us in the work of justification, but not only that, he also redeemed us from our bondage to sin. Think of the Apostle Paul. He was once in deep bondage to sin, once persecuting the church, and doing, in doing so, uh, persecuting the Lord himself. Think of the marvelous grace that was extended to the Apostle Paul when, when he caught, well, um, on the road to Damascus. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners, but now... We, know, we now know the full story of the Apostle Paul. He was used greatly by the Lord, even, even saved from his, his former life of persecution of the church. Paul was saved by the loving grace of God. If he can be saved, anyone can. He was then transformed from his life of sin and persecution to holiness and, and, and being persecuted himself. So if, if God calls us, we can be saved even despite how wretched we were before. Paul underwent much toil all for the sake of the gospel. 
we could learn much from the Apostle Paul. We also read of David having fallen into, into treacherous sins. Yet he was restored by God's grace. God's grace is everlasting and free to all whom Christ came to save. Let us be the light to the lost sinners around us. Let us not fall into our former sins and that once ensnared us. Take up the armor of God and be on the alert. Stand ready for the day of the Lord that's coming. Do not, do not sleep. Stand ready for the day of the Lord that no one except the Father knows. Do not be caught sleeping when Christ comes back in glory. He gave his life so that, he would, that we could have life and so that we would be ready for the day of his second coming. When Christ comes back, will he find faith on the earth? Let us look at the parable of the unjust judge. If you would look at the parable of the unjust judge in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Now, now he was telling them a parable to show that all at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Nor now will not God bring about just, justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith when, when he comes again? If we have life indeed, we must show evidence of it being uh, by staying constant in the word and constant in prayer and all the public means of grace and all the private means of grace. Let us not be left wanting. Let us seek to be willing to sacrifice much for the sake of Christ like he sacrificed so much for us. Let us do honor to the Son and be more conformed to his image. This is what it means to be in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We are under a new law. We are no longer bound to our old ways. We are new creatures in Christ. Take, the, take comfort. We are, we are new. But let us not, in, in being new creatures, let us not fall back into our old self. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel. And let us shine our light before men. Let us shine brightly so that men may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. As for applications, number one, being in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus means that we are not, not, we are not bound to our former sins. We are no longer in the law of life, uh, law, law of sin and death. We, that's, that was our former life, but now we, are, we have hope. We, we have a new hope. We once were gravely dead and sinful, yet Christ redeemed us from all of that. Let us keep this in mind. We can work on conquering our remaining sins in the power that Christ has given us by his great sacrifice. The Spirit is at work in our lives so that we may live and bear fruit that of such life. Second application. Also, keep in mind that you will know the tree by its fruit. This is how people will know that we are truly saved and truly co-heirs of Christ. Remember, Christ is the vine and we are the branches. What type of branch we are is determined by the fruit we bear. If we live for the Lord, we will bear good fruit abiding in Christ and will not be cut off from the, from the, branch, from the vine. God is the master gardener he is, who prunes the branches so that they be abundant. He knows which branches to prune and to, to make, make more fruit, to, to give, to prune to, make which, to allow them to make more fruit. Let us make sure that we are the good branches. Our third application. If you be not in Christ, you will not have a new life. You will still be left in your sins and left wanting. You will be under God's wrath lest you come to Him. Come to Him, even today, so that you lay claims to the great salvation. Do not neglect so great a salvation. In conclusion, let us fully understand 
what we what being in the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus means. It means we are we as true Christians are no longer bound to our, our the law of sin and death. We are free from our old life. What used to hold us in great bondage is no longer our master. We have been freed from such a brave to brave depraved condition. Christ is all. Christ is all in all. And let it let us let us let it be let him be our all. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we pray that you will help help us um, be faithful in living out the, the text that was founded. Let us be um, show evidence of being in the law of the spirit of law, life in Christ Jesus. Help us to be, bear good fruit and help us to be um, co-heirs with Christ Himself. And pray that we will uh, we pray that we will honor you and glorify you you and be the light of the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.